we're talking about using WordPress, Ansible, and Git to, uh, to manage your website. So, you know, sort of obligatory slide, who am I? I just actually started working at MailChimp, so uh, still trying to find my way around there. I've uh, been doing WordPress for a little while, uh, Ansible a couple of years. I almost certainly drink more coffee than you, and I've written way more bad code, uh, very seriously. And this is where to find me. There's the snark version and the less snark version, so you guys can read. A couple disclaimers. I think Google exists. You can use it. You all know how to read, and you don't need me to read your, my slides to you. Uh, working with servers, I'm kind of a fan. It's fun stuff. We're going to do some of that today. And I also think that Elvis is alive, and Matt Mullenweg is probably him. Uh, can you guys see my little footnotes? They're important. Um, so the first question that you should ask, or the you know sort of the motivation, I was talking to some guys back here earlier uh, about yes, you know Roots has done some great work with Ansible, for example. Uh, actually, there's also a project. It's not using Ansible. It's uh, VVV. It's a great, very full-featured project. You should use Trellis by Roots. You should use VVV. I guess that was by Tenup. Do you know? Uh, there's some great projects out there, but. It's also really important that you understand how these technologies work. And if you just spend a minute and think about the question, how does the internet work? How long does it take before you start feeling kind of stupid? <laughs> like it takes me 10 seconds. Well, you know, I type in something, and there's a DNS resolve happening. You get lost very quickly when you actually have to sit down and imagine that you're explaining how the internet works to a two-year-old. You should definitely think about that problem and to be honest, I've been doing this for 10 years, and I still can't answer the question very, to my own satisfaction. Uh, but I think it's something that we should try to do. What's that? It's incredible. It is incredible. It's also a lot of uh, Perl scripts and, and <laughs> duct tape holding everything together. But it's, it's, uh, it's important to understand how this stuff works at a fairly low level. BGP. Yes. Perl, PGP, you know, Bash. There's, there's a lot of duct tape, and uh, it's kind of like sausages and laws, right? You want to see this stuff getting made. Software is the same way. Uh, it's also one of my footnotes. Um, but I do think that we need to consider this. And one of, the, one of the ways that I want to encourage everyone to think about how the internet works is to start on the back end and say, you know, how does a server work? Towards that end, uh, there's this technology called Ansible. Now, Ansible, by the way, uh, it's named after this book uh, called Ender's Game, which I think is also a movie. And there was a sci-fi book written a long, long time ago. And this term Ansible kind of caught on the sci-fi community. Uh, as a d fictional device to manage large fleets of servers. The idea behind Ansible is that, hey, you know, I may want to go provision a server. I may want to go install WordPress, or I may want to go install a database on one server. Or for that matter, maybe I want to run it on two or three or 200 different servers. I'm going to get tired of typing SSH stuff, right? I'm a human. I make mistakes. I mean, I don't, but you guys probably do, right? The uh, only one person laughed. That's not good. It's all going to be downhill from here, guys. Like, I got a lot of these corny, corny jokes, and I mean, it's, this is not good. I know. It's a conference. It just, uh, but yeah, the, the whole idea of how do we manage a large number of servers uh, without actually having to physically go out ourselves and manage them. And that's Ansible is one of many tools. Uh, there's Chef, there's Salt, there's Puppet. Uh, Ansible, of course. There's a lot of different tools that do this. Ansible, in my experience, has been one of the most easy for people to learn because it's very, very, very similar to SSH. If you've ever SSH into a server, Ansible is going to make a lot of sense to you. Uh, how it works in a nutshell is you define, um, let's say you've got some unit of work, like installing Nginx or installing you know, IP tables or UFW or something like that. That might be considered a role. Now, you could just define a specific task, but there's usually some unit of work that you're going to want to do, like install WordPress and configure it. You're going to have to change the password in wp-config. You're going to want to hit the salt URI. Has everybody here installed WordPress before? Yeah, so a lot of you have. I mean, it's, there's going to be a certain number of steps that you always end up doing. And those are the sorts of things that you can very easily shove into a role in Ansible and just say, hey, you know what? Go talk to all of these different servers, go run these specific roles, perform this amount of work on them. Uh, role scoping is one of those things that it's going to be kind of, um, it's hard to define an appropriate role scope. I mean, I could sit here and say, well, you know, it, this should be a role, but that should be a task, and maybe this should be a variable. But one of the better ways to actually kind of get a feel for this is to look at other people's code. By the way, how many of you guys spend an awful lot of time reading other people's code? Every room, every hand in the room should go up for that, by the way. Like the one thing that you can do as a developer to really, really, really improve is read other people's code. 
It's kind of miserable sometimes, I'm not going to lie. But you learn a lot doing it. Uh, so we're going to actually take a look at some other people's code. We're going to start with this guy. He's probably really smart, probably a great presenter, very funny, you know. <laughs> I have heard, I don't know. Never met him. But uh, this is a project that I'm working on right now. Uh, and I call it Teller. I don't know why. It's just I needed a simple acronym that I could pronounce. That's like Hadoop or anything else, right? Just you know, <laughs> word salad. Let me grab something. And, uh, and what Teller is, is, uh, is setting up my little cluster of servers the way that I want them set up. So I want WordPress. Uh, I also want you know, search by Elasticsearch. I don't want to use plain vanilla MySQL. I want to use Percona. And I also want replication on my Percona boxes. Uh, and then I want to use Hip Hop Virtual Machine and blah, blah, blah. And I've got all these different sort of my laundry list of things that I want on my servers. And Teller is a way for me to install it. Uh, so with that said, uh, we're just going to take a look at some of this code. And then we're going to look at some other code. I've got a bunch of roles in here. So I've got this role that installs Z Shell. If you guys use Z Shell, anybody in here? I just want you to know that you're the smartest people in the room, <laughs> objectively speaking. Uh, I've got a role that installs WordPress. I've got a role that installs Vim. Are there any Emacs users here? Good, I can make fun of them. Uh, are there any UFW users here? You guys know what UFW is? Do you guys know what IP tables is? Has anyone here ever used IP tables? Okay, those people, keep your hand up if you like working with IP tables. <laughs> Which are, everybody's hand just went down. It's not surprising. IP tables is miserable for most of us. For the, you know, if you're not a network engineer, IP tables is pretty miserable. UFW literally stands for uncomplicated firewall. If you don't put a firewall on your boxes, somebody will DDoS you. Somebody will hijack your server. You absolutely need to use a firewall. If you're going to do it, there's a couple different ways to do it. These guys over at Roots, I think they use, uh, what is it, FPM on Trellis? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's different ways to do it, but UFW is pretty simple. For, for most of us, it's a very good uh, firewall to use. Metabase, Logstash, Kibana, HHVM, that's where I'm actually installing HVM, HHVM, which is the hip-hop virtual machine, Facebook, PHP. Uh, Nginx, Elasticsearch, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just installing a bunch of stuff here. And since we're all pretty familiar with WordPress, well, let's actually go ahead and take a look at some of these tasks. This is what an a Ansible playbook actually looks like. So I'm creating a WordPress uh, directory. So this might be something like MKDIR in, in a shell, right? I'm just creating a directory. And I'm also saying, here's who owns it. Here's the permissions on the directory. And I'm, you know, we've got all that in one convenient command. Download and, and extract WordPress. We've all done that, right? This is, this is not any different than what we're doing in SSH, usually. Uh, copy the WordPress config file. We've all done that before. You know, these are all very, they should be very familiar things to you. Let's go look at some other people's code. Um, this is my slide. So Trellis, uh, we got a guy here, at least one guy from Roots. Uh, Julian? Yeah, that guy? Smart dude. You should definitely talk to him. Uh, Roots put together this thing called Trellis. And Trellis is a, uh, it's a framework for using Ansible together with WordPress. It's very, very, very good. And if I were doing something in production today, I would definitely use it. The reason I don't necessarily think you should start there is back to that first slide. Think about how the internet works. How far you know, can you explain something like that before, I don't even know how this even works anymore. You probably need to build stuff by hand, a little bit, just enough to get a feel for, hey, now I see what Trellis is doing here. Now I see how this, you know, they're putting, I guess you've got MariaDB, I think. Here's where they're defining that. If I wanted to flip out MariaDB and put Percona in there or plain vanilla MySQL, how would you do that? How do you actually work with something like that? If you pick up Trellis to start with, there's lots and lots and lots of code. There's lots and lots of things happening. I don't actually think you should start there, not because it's a bad program. It's very much not. It's great. But you're going you're gonna to miss some details. You're going to not understand how this stuff works correctly. So I'm going to come back to another re repository that I would encourage you all to use. We'll come back to that in a moment. But as you can see, I mean, they've got, you know, their, like we saw mine, right? I was actually logging into the server. I was downloading WordPress. I was making a directory, et cetera. These guys do it a little bit differently. They actually use WP CLI to install WordPress. So that's another way that you can do that. You should absolutely compare my repository for Teller and how I'm installing WordPress with the way that they do it. You'll start to form opinions about, hey, this makes sense or this does not. By the way, does this all make sense what's actually happening? Like, I, I know you haven't read the code yet. Again, I think slide, you know, code in slides is typically pretty boring. You need to read it yourself. You need to work with it yourself. 
But does it make sense? I would log into a server, I would install WordPress. I might use WP CLI, I might be downloading a tar file and unpacking it. But I mean, when we're installing WordPress, there's a certain unit of work and there's a certain thing that I would normally do. And I maybe don't want to do that on 500 different servers. Maybe I want my software to go and install it for me. With that, because the, uh, the Wi-Fi here is pretty bad, I've got a playbook here. Earlier this morning, it was installing WordPress on 100 different servers all around the world. And it was pretty slow on my Wi-Fi. Here, it's like crawling, right? Because it's just, I, you know, there's no way I can install WordPress on 100 servers from here using their Wi-Fi. But I can install it on five. And I'm actually going to go ahead and click, you know, kick this off. For now, what I want to point out is, do we agree there's nothing on this site? I can refresh it all day long. It's not that my internet's dead. I can go, I mean, hell, we've been navigating around here. I can go to Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. Go to LinkedIn. My internet's fine, but these sites do not exist. We agree? So that, at the end of the talk, that's going to be different. And this is, by the way, how you run commands in Ansible. I've got a playbook. I've got some stuff that I want to do. I've also got an inventory file. Here's the stuff I want to do it to. My inventory file has five servers on it. So I can go over here to my servers. <coughs> And you can see that I've got a total of five of them. So I've got one in Canada, I've got one in Germany, I've got one in Singapore, I've got one in New York. That's the one at the top. And then I've also got it on a Debian install because I've been installing it on Ubuntu 14.04 and I just wanted to see if it would work. So that's a Debian 8, that I'm install a Debian 7 that I'm installing on. And uh, when I go back here, I hit this. This is what's going to happen. I'm just going to let this run for a minute. You guys can kind of get a feel for what's happening. This task here, that's connecting to the server. It's saying, by the way, I'm talking to all five servers now. It's going to start doing some additional work. It's going to take a while because the Wi-Fi is slow. This is going over SSH. And by the way, SSH is slow when you're talking to 100 different servers or five different servers. So that is something that you will run into. Uh, now it's installing system packages. So I want things like Git. I want things like whatever else I put in there. I, I tend to be pretty obsessed with monitoring. So I've got a lot of HTOP and DSTAT and stuff like that that I'm putting on the server. But you can see it's in Huh? Blow up the servers? Who do you think you are, man? <laughs> uh, yeah, hang on. That is actually, by the way, one of my favorite things to do is stand up servers and then just start blowing them up. Like, I, I, can't, I don't know why, but there's something so satisfying about <coughs> crash that server and then rebuild it. It's just very, very fun. So, uh, so you guys can maybe see this now? So that first task where it's saying, hey, you know, I'm in, I'm in communication with these five different servers. If I had a better Wi-Fi, I'd be doing it on more of them. Uh, this core utils thing, this is just literally installing things that I want on my server, like dstat, htop, et cetera. By the way, this may look for, you guys all know what apt is, right? Aptitude? Yeah. Cool. So you app get install in GenX or something like that. Uh, I can do the same thing, but I can do it smarter. Those are the things that I want to install. Can you guys see that? So I want to install dstat. I want to install htop, sysstat, tar, unzip, et cetera. I can just loop over them. Very, very simple. That installs anything that I want to install an app. I can pop it into that list. It's going to go and install it for me. If that changes, right, if I realize, oh, you know, geez, I, I really want Java 8. If I can install that, I guess I can't install Java 8 with, uh, with app yet. Whatever else you want to put on there, you can put it in there. HHVM, you know, you can do that. Yeah? If you're installing a package, Yes, indeed, you can. Uh, so one of the so HHVM, for example, that's not in the main repository. <coughs> Do you, by the way, are we all familiar with code repositories? How that works? Mm -hmm. I feel bad for those guys. Like, if you are a code maintainer, I just want to say thank you because it's hard. Um, yeah, you can absolutely add a specific. You can add the PPA signature, and uh, and install it. And in fact, the HHVM. I'll show you that afterwards. But that actually does that. Uh, so I'm going to let this continue, but it's installing a bunch of core Python packages, because I also do a fair amount of stuff in Python, and I want a library in there called Glances so I can monitor things. It's going to go install this. It's going to be fairly slow. But in the end, we're going to have five working WordPress installations uh, on these five different servers all around the world. Back to the slides. <coughs> these are some other examples of how people uh, are using Ansible to install WordPress. And the reason that I mentioned these, I, I sort of cherry-picked ones that I thought were pretty good. Uh, 
to be clear, with the exception of the first ones, it's actually pretty bad. Um, no, I really I, I don't like it at all. But I'm going to come back to that too. Uh, these are next four, though. They're, they're, they've got some nice ideas. They've got some nice design patterns. And the reason I mention all four of them, and the reason I asked about, you know, have you read code? How much have you spent a lot of time reading code? You should absolutely read this code. It's going to take a long time, There's a, but you want to see how do they install WordPress here? How do they install it there? How are they configuring Nginx here? How are they in, you know, configuring Nginx there? You will learn so much about how to configure a server and how to make a server very, very fast just by reading these code, these specific repositories. With that, we're going to move on. Uh, one of the things that, that's important about Ansible is you define a bunch of, you know, I mentioned, hey, we've got these different roles. Well, that, that's all fine and good, but if I can't put variables in there, it doesn't do very much for me. So an example of a variable might be your database user or your database password. So where I can show you what that actually looks like. Uh, da, 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 da. I've got a bunch of roles that I'm installing. And for example, my WordPress defaults. I'm saying, you know what? By default, this is where I want you to install WordPress. This is what I want the database to be called. This is what the user should be. Now, I can override these defaults. These specific variables that live in the defaults for the WordPress role, that's saying, if I don't tell you anything else, assume this is what I want. But there's a pretty good chance that I don't want my WB password to be pass, because I'm not that stupid. <laughs> pretty close, but not that stupid. So, you know, in the can Canadian install, obviously, I think the, the MySQL user should be WP user, eh? <laughs> and the MySQL pass obviously should be, what's this all about? <laughs> and, you know, with Germany, I don't even remember where the beer is great, right? I mean, Singapore, the password is you will never guess. Obviously, these are strong passwords, and you're going to want to change these sorts of things. So uh, variables in Ansible are a way that you can do that. By the way, does that, so I know that I'm not going into a lot of detail yet. I'm going to come back to that. But is the whole notion of you've got a role and you've also got some variables, does that sort of make sense? Cool. By the way, kind of a pain in the butt to do this by hand, isn't it? Like if you had to go install WordPress, they say it's a five minute install. If you've done it a few times, if you know what you're doing, you can do it in five minutes. This morning with my slow Wi-Fi, I installed it on 20 of them in five minutes. So it's nice to have your computers. Computers are stupid, but they're also very powerful. And if you kind of learn how to use Ansible or Puppet or Chef, I'm not going to tell you Ansible is the best thing in the world. It's a tool. It's a very useful tool. It may be helpful to you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that whole five minute install thing, install it in 500 servers if you want. You just need a fast Wi Fi connection uh, or a fast server that's doing this. You could all actually, by the way, if you want to put this center, you know, like put a box in a data center and run Ansible from Linux, you can do that. And I've done that before too, much faster because you get the local connections. Uh, where were we? We were talking about, uh, you know, the rules uh, and the variables. There's, there's properties of it. It's kind of like the, you guys know the, the template hierarchy in WordPress, right? Same idea. Do I have a page PHP file? Or what is it? Single, I guess? Single.php? Does that exist? No, use index, right? So that's how, we're, that's how these, uh, these variables are going to work in Ansible 2. You can define a certain, there is a certain, uh, I guess, variable hierarchy. It's very, very similar to the template hierarchy. You can read all about all the rules there. And if you're thinking, if you think through, how do, how do I use variables compared to the WordPress hierarchy, you're never going to go wrong there. Uh, let me get back to my slides here. Uh, Git. So um, if you're not familiar with this guy up here, Linus Torvaldus, everybody knows who wrote Git, right? Linus Torvaldus, he wrote <laughs> Linux as well. And uh, the reason he called it Git was because he likes to name software after himself. And Git's actually an old English uh, term for somebody who's unpleasant. Uh, so, and other useless trivia. Here's where Ansible came from. Uh, but Git's a version. What's that? Yeah, it, Linus. So this gentleman up at the front said Linus is pretty unpleasant himself. It's, uh, I mean, among software developers, he's kind of a hero for obvious reasons. Uh, he does have a tendency to be fairly abrasive. Uh, there are a few famous uh, conflicts between him, for example, in Nvidia, where he he got a little bit heated. Um, but yeah, Linus is a, Linus is a funny character. Um, do you guys know anything about version control systems? Okay, you guys all use Git? The biggest thing, and, and this is one of those, uh, just kind of an FYI, this is more useless trivia. The difference between something like Git and something like SVN is in Git, we all know the history. We all know what happened. 
Whereas in you know version control systems early on, SVN in particular, and, and sort of the, the deviance of SVN, deviance, the derivatives, <laughs> deviance of it, yes, uh, the derivatives of SVN, uh, only the master server knew everything that happened. And that can actually be problematic, right? You know, you, maybe, maybe you want every person who has a laptop who has access to this repository to be able to determine what code was pushed and when and what different branches existed and so forth. So Git is distributed. Everybody has, a, has full access to what happened. Uh, there's a ton of workflows for, for using Git. And by the way, has, has anybody here used Git specifically with WordPress? How do you guys like using Git with WordPress? It's awesome. I mean, imagine a large enterprise with no version control, and we were the first. Okay. Right? So it's been a real savior because we have distributed I, developers. Okay. Right? So it is the best How many, for us to get it on the system. So this guy's saying that he has a distributed team of developers. How many developers do you have? Um, we don't. Okay. It's, it's like 20, but they're in different units and divisions and right. different timelines. Like, go build a plugin and put it in there and let's, let's rock and roll. You know? like, so in a situation like that where, where, where you've got a large distributed team, <coughs> lots of different departments and so forth, something like Git's going to basically save your life. It really is sort of before Git and after Git with you know, having access to or ha giving distributed version control to the team. How many people here work on WordPress kind of by themselves or maybe with one other person? To be honest with you, I mean, I'd love to tell you otherwise, but Git's not going to do that much for you. It's not a bad idea to learn it. I, my own site, I mean, I can't, I can't lie to you. I don't have my own site in Git version control. I've got backups because it's not that high traffic, and I'm not doing anything, you know. Be reasonable. You know, if you're working on a large distributed team, yes, Git's going to, it really will be before Git and after Git. Uh, if you're just doing your own stuff, you need to know how to use it. But in particular, why I think it belonged in this talk was, A, it made the acronym work. Uh, <laughs> it's not entirely true. Uh, but B, it's back to this notion of reading your own code. That repository that I showed you earlier, TLR, Teller. Okay, so I'm installing HHVM. I'm installing Elasticsearch. I'm installing Percona MySQL. I've got replicated MySQL going on. I want SSL with uh, Let's Encrypt. There's a lot of mechanics here. And I got to remember what I'm doing. I got to learn from my mistakes. Git is a great way to tell on yourself. It's a really, really great way to learn so that you understand, hey, did I learn anything new here? Maybe the way that I was installing Nginx was wrong. Maybe I didn't know something. And you want to pull that additional information in. If you don't have a history, it's actually kind of hard to learn what you were thinking and why. It's going to be really hard for, you know, to kind of take it back to the first slide. It's going to be really hard to understand how the internet works without some history of what you've been learning about in the first place. You will forget things. So, Sort of the first, I guess, point here is, yeah, you should learn Git so you can work with WordPress. If you're ever working on a distributed team, it really is going to save your butt. Uh, but in, it just your Ansible stuffs in particular, you need version control there, or you're going to get so lost. It, it really is, you, there's just no way you can keep all of it straight. Uh, for that matter, you might break things. You know, In theory, when I'm provisioning stuff, have you guys ever heard that statement? Um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again with a different result. Have you ever worked with code bases that actually do have a different result, depending on how you run it? Yeah. It's fun, isn't it? Um, so a lot of times when you're running it, you know, in theory, uh, when you're running your Ansible playbook, you should be able to run it again and again and again and get the same outcome. It should be describing the end result. If you do it wrong, and by the way, when you're learning it, you will. You will make a mistake at some point. <laughs> And you're going to do something that completely alters the state of the system so that if you were to run that same playbook again, you're going to blow stuff up. If you don't have your Git history on what you were doing and why, that's going to be very, very difficult to find and very, very difficult to sort out. So use Git, use Ansible, learn how servers work. Specifically, with your, Git, with your Ansible stuff, you want that inversion control. You can use SVN, you can use Git. Personally, I think you should put it on Git and, and put it up there for us to read because it's, you know, it's good. That's how you learn. Uh, WordPress and Git, if you want to learn how to use WordPress and Git together, uh, specifically, like this guy's using WordPress and Git on a team, if you want to do that, if you read one article, it's that first one, two articles, the second one, three articles, the third one. You guys know who that last guy is, Mark Jayquith? Core developer. Worth paying attention to what he has to say. He's got a lot of good ideas. Uh, the other guy's stupid. Ignore them. Uh, so what's Git got to do this? That's again, I, I jumped ahead. You definitely want your stuff under control, version control, specifically your Ansible stuff. You will do something stupid eventually when you're trying to learn how servers work and learn how to manage your, 
if you want to go look through Teller, right, that thing that I was showing you earlier, look at how many commits there are on there. <coughs> Figure out how many times I'm like undoing that stupid thing that I just did. Like it's often the case. Uh, and, and this is really useful stuff. By the way, if you're using WordPress and Git, do you guys know what continuous integration is? You do. A couple people around the room. So the continuous integration is this idea that, hey, you know, maybe I've got some version control system, a Git repository, whatever. Once I'm done, once it's on the master, let's bundle this thing up, let's ship it to the server, and let's run it. That's what continuous integration can actually do. It's very, very cool stuff. There's lots of different platforms like Travis. Uh, I forget all the other stuff, but there's, there's like 20 of them. Lots of flame wars abound about which one's better than this one. But the entire idea of it is, okay, you've got your code, it's on the master of the repository, now how do you get it to your server and actually run it? And you can automate that stuff too. Uh, which is great if you're working with like 50 different WordPress servers, for example, and you're updating this plugin or something like that. Or for that matter, uh, maybe you want to deploy certain, I don't know, something to, uh, Hard to think of a good example with WordPress, honestly. I guess a plugin's about the only thing, but you could also use the plugin management infrastructure, so it's kind of hard. I was going to make a point. We use deploy HQ to do this because we have this model. Okay. Right? And, that, and that has saved our about a million times because undoing the commit is the problem, especially if you're in production. Right. right. And you hope everything runs the right way, but it's very quick to pull it out of the commit and redeploy and have it stripped out of the so what, uh, what this gentleman just said is that uh, they use Deploy HQ for continuous integration, and one of the most important things that they're able to do is roll back a history. So if they commit something to master, it goes and deploys, and oops, the test failed. It didn't, we didn't catch something that we should have. Now we need to roll back. Uh, it's very actually easy to do that in a continuous integration type of environment because you've got, you know, here's the state of the master at time t, and then I you know, go forward a week. Well, crap, we broke it roll back to the last version. It's very, very easy to do that in a continuous in integration environment. Uh, if you're doing WordPress with a lot of, I mean, it sounds like you are, most of us aren't uh, <coughs> working on large teams with complicated projects. I imagine Roots does. If you do, great. These are great tools to use and you should absolutely use them. If you're not, if you're just kind of working on your own personal site or maybe a specific client, to be honest, I think continu continuous integration is maybe going to be overkill for you, but give it a shot anyway. You'll learn something really awesome and it's still fun to know how the internet works. Uh, which is really, I mean, if I could subtitle my talk anything, it's Ansible is a great way to understand why we're all here and what we're actually doing in the first place. If you think of your job as I build websites in WordPress, yeah, it's kind of limiting though, right? I mean, you could build an iPhone application with WordPress. In fact, there's some guys that did that. They've got an entire framework for doing that. You could say something like, uh, I want to build uh, a social network using WordPress. Well, it's MySQL, it's PHP, that's Facebook, literally. You could do that. But for you to actually do something like that well, you need to understand how the servers work, and I think Ansible is a great way to do that, and I think it's a great way to kind of tell on yourself and learn from mistakes. Uh, I mentioned earlier, just a side note, if you guys can read any of the slides in the bottom, I'm making fun of Emacs again because I'm a Vim user and it's my job. Uh, <laughs> So the moment we've all been waiting for, right? We're going to provision a server, which we actually started earlier. But this is a little side note game as well. We take a small diversion to determine where's Wapu. Does anyone see him yet? Top right. Top right. Okay, it's way too easy. Uh, so let's go take a look at our servers and see if everything's provisioned. Yeah, we're done. All right. So this play recap, right? So we ran a job earlier. We ran a specific playbook which is, uh, I think it's, it is intentionally football terminology that, you know, here are the different moves that I want to create or execute. Uh, and so it's, it's done. Everything's okay. We changed the state of the system a couple of times. And, uh, and now back to these sites, which we all agreed weren't working. That one's fixed. It is magic, yes. That one's fixed. I can keep going. That one's fixed as well. That one, that one, and that one. So that's five servers running four, uh, two different operating systems in four different countries, et cetera. Uh, the five minute install, again, if you're using your own you know, Wi-Fi connection at home, you can typically install WordPress on 100 servers if you want it. If you've got 100 servers to deploy it on, it's not very complicated to do. Uh, and it's pretty quick. 
Uh, although, again, SSH, you know, keep in mind, like, you do have 100 connections around the world. Uh, so it, it will slow things down a little bit. Uh, that's it, actually. Um, no, it's not. Concluding remarks. <laughs> oh, that's right. We have to decimate other people's code. Uh, I mean, read other people's code. Uh, so I actually wanted to take a look, and this is, I, I do very strongly believe that one of the best ways to learn about servers is to do it. One of the best ways to tell on yourself is to, you know, version control your stuff. And one of the most important things that you can do is, I mentioned earlier, read other people's code. And I wanted to go ahead and do that. So DigitalOcean, I'm sure we're all familiar. If not, they're a VPS hosting company. Pretty good. Uh, actually, I really like them a lot, personally. Uh, and they've got this tutorial on how to install WordPress using Ansible. Uh, I don't agree with about half of what he says. Uh, now, that's fine, by the way. That, this, these are all sort of personal taste issues. But I thought it would be interesting to kind of go through here and, and highlight some specific things that I think are kind of not good and also show you why. So the first one that I want to point out is um, way, 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 way down here. The first one is that they're using Apache. That's obviously wrong, right? I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> took a minute. It was delayed. You guys like, wait, what? Yeah, Nginx all the way. Uh, not really. There's reasons. Um, -bum 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 -bum. Do you, have you guys ever used in Linux, have you guys ever used line in file from the command line? It's a really annoying command that's very easy to forget. And you're kind of going to be glad that you forgot it because it's actually not very useful. So right here, this line in file stuff, what that's literally doing is uh, it's editing the file on the server itself. Right? So it's saying, all right, I want you to update the default Apache site. So go to the, this particular file, this sites enabled 00 default conf, and I want you to run this regular expression to replace stuff on that specific file. That's not a very good idea. What could go wrong? Everything. Why? So he says everything. He's right. Why? Well, it's trying to change the file. What if the file got moved? That's a good point. So what if the file's not where you thought it would be? What if the file changed? Maybe you weren't the one making the change. That's a fair point. Let's think back to the continuous integration point. Can you do a rewind like that? Can you say, oops, I didn't mean to do that. That was a bad idea. You're changing the file. Maybe you, using a regex, you might be wrong. You might screw something up. That's probably not a good idea. That's my first issue. So how do we solve that problem? If I'm telling you that, hey, you know what? That's a bad idea. I don't want you to run line and file using Ansible. What do you do? What would be the ideal situation? You guys don't know Ansible, so you don't know what to do. That's fine. But what would be ideal? What's that? Use the variable. Use the variable. Okay, you could use a variable, but you're trying to basically take a, a configuration file, right? You've got an Apache configuration file or an Nginx configuration file, and you want to take this file and you want to put it on that server. In fact, that's exactly what you want to do, isn't it? You want to have a file here under <coughs> version control, and you want to say copy that to the server. And you might also want to use some variables, like he was saying, like my password. I might want to you know, have Ansible put my password in there for me. Does that make sense? We can do that with very Ansible very easily. So we can, for example, wp-config. I don't want to go edit wp-config on my server. I want Ansible to copy this file and put it on my server. And I want it to fill in some details for me. I want it to say, there's the database that you should be using. There's the user. There's the password. If you guys recall, earlier we were doing Canada. What's this? this is my password, eh? Like that's, I want you to fill those details in for me and copy that file to the server. What's the advantage of doing this? Yes. You have complete control over the file. Arguably, more importantly, you've got control over the file's history because your file's history is now in Git version control. So how many of you, when you're working on your site, you've maybe got your code in, 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 uh, in version control? How many of you have your configuration in version control? How many of you? I could literally go turn off. So I'm running about maybe 15 different servers at the moment. How many of you could I just literally blow up your servers and say, bring it back online? You, yes, Mike, you guys, OK, <laughs> backups, et cetera. So three hands went up, right? Th four, four hands went up. That's the kind of thing that you can do using Ansible if you do it right, if you actually version control your infrastructure, not just your code. It's a very important thing to do, in my opinion. And so can I, can I point, yes, absolutely. You haven't said it yet, but I do want to make sure it's clear. Like, we actually operate a single instance of WordPress across multiple servers under a load balancer. So Ansible saves our butt 
because that config file has to go to five different servers. Okay, I'm going to repeat that for the, for the camera and also for the people who are watching. So he brought up a very good point. Um, let's suppose that you're not, you're running five different copies of WordPress. They're all the same thing. You've got a load balancer out front that's you know saying, okay, request A goes to server one, request B goes to server two, et cetera. You've got to deploy any configuration changes that you make to these five servers. You have to make sure it's on all five of them, and you have to make sure that there's no typos or human error. Ansible can do that. So can Puppet, so can Chef, so can a lot of other things. But that, you know, these are the tools that we use when we're trying to do something like that. I run uh, my day job several Elasticsearch servers. I have to do the same thing, where I've got a ton of different servers that I have to deploy my code to. Hey, you know, I need more memory here. I need this other setting here. For me to deploy those changes to all of those servers, I don't want to log in to each one of these servers and make the change. I will make a typo eventually, and it's slow, and I've got better things to do with my time. I want to change it one time, and I want it under version control, which is where Git comes into play. Because it's, it's one thing to deploy it to five servers. When something goes wrong, you want to know why. You want to know, hey, this broke, and here's what happened. That's where you know, Git and Ansible together can be very powerful. Again, Chef, Puppet, whatever, do whatever you want. Just have it in version control and deploy your code. Uh, da, 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 da. We, were, we were decimating reading other people's code. Did you have any other? Any? OK. Um, they do a couple of other things. I don't know that I like this. This is an interesting pattern. Uh, it's one I think Trellis avoids this. So Trellis, again, is that project. There are links uh, that Roots put together. We've got a role. And this role has a specific handler. And that handler restarts Apache. So that, there's that question of role scoping. If I'm installing WordPress, can I assume that I've got Apache? Maybe not. Maybe I'm running Nginx. Maybe I'm using Windows. I think it can do that, actually. Uh, that may not be an appropriate role scope. It might be, but it might not be. Those are the sorts of things that you'll start to notice. Where you'll read different code repositories. I actually do this, too, where I, I assume I'm using Nginx, because I always will. But those are the sorts of things that you might start to notice. Hey, wait a second. Do I really want this unit of work here, or am I making an assumption that I don't want to be making? <clears throat> in this specific case, if you were to read up here and say, well, that's wrong, they're using Apache, you've got to make 15 other changes to this bit of code. I understand why they're doing it, but that's the kind of thing that you want to start paying attention to. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that just immediately stood out to me. The pseudo CAG, by the way, a lot of the tutorials. Uh, one reason why you want to read repositories, and specifically ones that are currently being updated, if you read a tutorial like this, it's fine. I understand why the guy wrote it the way that he did. It's, there's nothing technically wrong with it. But you'll also run into a lot of deprecated code this way. So about half of the things that this guy's doing, uh, not half of them, but several of the statements, uh, it's not really how you're supposed to do it anymore. Using the command to move a file like that, that's not, you don't need to do that. Uh, there's all this line and file crap that he's doing. You don't need to do that either, right? There's these things that you're using, Ansible itself is a growing project. It has changed over the years. It has changed since this guy wrote his thing. If you're using Git, if you're reading other people's code, you'll see a lot of the best practices in action because people do typically, especially if it's a repository that's being maintained, they'll start to incorporate that. They'll stop doing things that have been deprecated or have been recognized as really terribly bad ideas, uh, like using Apache. Um, with that, that's pretty much my talk, and I'm going to open that up for questions. Are there any? Yes. Great question. So the question is, what is the benefit of using something like Ansible as opposed to a Bash script <laughs> or an AMI? Uh, by the way, an AMI is an Amazon machine image. Uh, it's a very good question. So on the topic of the AMI, I'm going to abstract away from that from a little bit. And I'm going to say, instead of you know, specifically an AMI, maybe you're using like a Docker image, for example. AMI is I would object to vendor lock-in. What if Amazon goes away? What if you know, they no longer support whatever AMI stuff you're doing? That's some vendor lock-in that you maybe want. But you could just as easily you know, have a Docker image or something like that. Docker, by the way, it, it builds little containers of code. Uh, and you could deploy them. I absolutely think the whole AMI concept uh, can make sense. It's, it's for a lot of people, something like Docker, something like uh, an AMI, it actually does make a lot of sense. Now, one thing about an AMI. Let's suppose that, uh, that you want to run, that you've built an AMI, 
and you're currently in East Coast whatever, uh, they're East Coast 1. And then, oh crap, that data center went away, which it has been known to do at some time. It's been a long time since they've had a major outage, but let's suppose that the East Coast 1 uh, gets hit by a hurricane and goes away. Can you put your, your AMI in the West Coast? You cannot. Look it up. You can absolutely look it up. So that's a specific to AMIs, by the way. You cannot, these machine images have to be specific to the individual locations. So if you're going to go actually make however many AMIs you need for however many regions you're in, go for it. Absolutely, go for it. If you want to use something like Docker, absolutely, go for it. It's a lot more complicated than this. And I would argue, again, before you go start working on Docker, start working with the machines that you have and start understanding them. Because if you try to go from zero to Docker, that's going to be kind of difficult, to be honest. If you go from, I know how to SSH to, I'm going to try to manage my, my servers that I normally would manage with SSH using Ansible, that's going to make a lot more sense. And then you're going to start graduating into, hey, I want to build this stuff in Docker. Hey, I want to you know, build my own AMIs. With, again, the caveat that certain things you may, uh, the reason you can't transfer them, by the way, is they're specific to actually to the hardware. So you have to build for whatever hardware they're using and the East Coast versus the West. Kind of a bummer. But, and they may have changed that very recently. I don't know. If, if you know better than I do, then you know, power to you. Do you know better? <laughs> you may very well. I could be wrong, by the way. Don't take my word, right? The sort of reading rainbow caveat. I could be totally wrong about that. I don't think I am. Um, <laughs> I think I'm wrong, but you know, nobody ever says that. I don't think I'm wrong <laughs> trivially. Uh, so the, the other question is, what's wrong with a bash script? Let's take a look at one. That's actually one of the slides in here was I said, hey, uh, Take a look at VVV. That's what they do, by the way. They have this giant bash script that goes and installs a bunch of stuff. Now, I'm going to pull that up. Roots over here. Now, by the way, I love VVV. VVV is absolutely great. I'm not here to knock them. But like everybody else, they make mistakes, or they make calls that I might find limiting. One of them is, that's their shell script. All seven, eight, nine, 825 lines of it. Now, I come to you and I say, you know what? I like VVV, VVV is great, but I want to use Percona MySQL. Get cracking. You have 825 lines of code that you have to manage. It's not role scoped. You got to read all those 825 lines and don't make a mistake. By the way, you, know, you just know what the probability of making a mistake is or how that's correlated to line length? The longer the code, the more likely you're going to screw it up. So that's my argument against a bash script. Yeah, Mike. I've got another argument against bash scripts. <laughs> <laughs> Mike has another argument against bash scripts. Let's hear it. Um, the, the point of, of Ansible or Puppet or Chef is to essentially state what you want the end result to be. And when you run the script, it'll make the, the Ansible script, it'll make sure that it gets into that state. Whereas a bash script, for example, uh, might. Um, the bash script is a procedural, whereas the um, Ansible is declarative. I'm going to repeat that again for the sake of the camera. So what Mike is talking about is actually a notion called item potency. Mike is a pretty sophisticated developer. He's a great guy. He runs a company, New Clarity or something like that. Smart guy. You should absolutely talk to him. Um, what he's getting at is that Ansible, Chef, Puppet, et cetera, if you do it right, some of them are a little bit, I think actually Puppet would be hard to do wrong, but you know, Ansible, for example. If you do it right, Ansible's not telling, it's not actually going to do everything you tell it to do. It's not going to install SSH, OpenSSH again. It's not going to install Nginx 3 and 4 and 57 different times. In theory, if you run the same Ansible script on the same server again and again and again, you get the same result. With SSH, it's not a given, right? You might actually change the state of the system. You can at least describe what the infrastructure should look like and then let Ansible sort out the details. Oh, Nginx is already installed. That file already exists. Fine, I don't have to do anything. I, I've got actually, uh, if you were to look at my log file, there's some red code, which red obviously means errors, right? It doesn't. What I'm doing is I'm saying, check if Nginx is already there. If it is, leave it alone. So I'm using dpackage for that. That's the kind of stuff that you can do very easily in something like an Ansible or Chef or a Puppet is you can say, hey, you know what? Don't touch the state of the system. I need, uh, this is what I need it to look like. If it already looks like that, back off and don't do anything. That kind of stuff's very, very easy here. It's not very easy with a bash script. I don't even think you could do it with a bash script. Like for example, do you guys know what RAID is, RAID levels? 
write me a bash script that's not going to re-raid a system, like literally write over it, if you run it again and again and again and again. I don't know how you could write an, an idempotent raid controlling script. It might maybe could be done sort of, but I, I don't know how to do it. Whereas I can do that, you do something like that using a puppet or a chef or an Ansible. A lot of that you can potentially do, but the complexity goes up. Yeah, and so, so the point that he, he made is you maybe could write a bash script that does that, but the complexity is going to go up. And depending on the amount of work you're going to do, I mean, you could end up with, you know, VVV's 825 page or line uh, bash script, which is not anything against them. It's a great project. It's doing exactly what it needs to do. But you maybe don't want to do that because maybe you want something else. Maybe you want Percona. Uh, Julian? Yeah. yeah. Just because we're in here and talking about it right now, I wanted to mention one use case as to why somebody may want to do this, and that would be um, testing and staging. So, uh, like primarily, obviously we have, maybe there's a huge feature going out and you have a really important site, and just like you guys run load balancers or whatever like that, um, staging is going to, like using this for staging is gonna allow you to actually test what's gonna happen, so that's awesome if you have it through continuous integration, say it passes all of those things, if you still want to be able to put a site up for somebody to approve or somebody to work on or somebody to do stuff with, you can have the state of your application basically already defined. And so all you have to do is push it up wherever you need it to be. So I'm going to repeat that, what you said for the camera. Uh, so what Julian just said is that one reason why something like Ansible can be very useful is that um, for staging environments, for example, or if you want to do continued uh, development on a site that may already exist, if you're doing any sort of enterprise software development, it's, especially as you start kind of getting higher and higher up the, the food chain of what you're building, like if you're building a mom and pop blogger site, it worked on my machine doesn't sound quite as ridiculous as <laughs> when you're like working for CNN or something like that. Well, yeah, it worked on my machine. Sorry, <laughs> took down all of CNN. Oops, I mean, these sorts of excuses start losing sort of their, their value uh, as, as the sites that you're working on become more complex and more high traffic. And so what Julian's talking about is you get a lot more obsessed with testing your code, but also testing your infrastructure. Because your code might work on my machine, or my code might work on my machine, but it might not work on a fresh, clean server, for example, or I might miss something. If you guys have ever had the pleasure of upgrading MySQL, like on a really live, high traffic site, I have to, I have to stage that stuff. I have to test that stuff. Upgrading Elasticsearch, I have to stage it, I have to test it. And this allows me to basically like you would version control your site, where you might use, there's actually some plugins that do this now, I think. Uh, WP Revisioners, maybe, I don't know if that rings a bell for anybody. But in the same way, really what Ansible's doing is it's giving you the ability to version control your servers. Take it back a step, why do we care? Because servers are how the internet actually works. The internet itself is this server talking to that server, and if you want to understand <coughs> that, which I think you should, because that's how we make a living here, right? How many of you make a living working, using the internet somehow? The internet's very fundamental. And how many of you could talk to me for five minutes about how the internet works? Okay, I actually wanna to talk to all of you. <laughs> I really do, because it's, it's one of those things, and I'm not saying that, by the way, to, to be a jerk, although it made it actually mm -hmm. realize it kinda of came out jerky and I apologize. Um, it's the kind of thing, it's very, uh, Alice in Wonderland, you know, as you start thinking about how does the internet work, well, you kind of understand the basics and then you think about it, some, well, how does that work necessarily? You get further and further down the rabbit hole with it. Servers are a great, a great way to start reasoning about this kind of stuff. And, uh, and it's also kind of fun. I mean, like, I can go, Julian, if you guys don't know him, he works for Roots and uh, he's got some great stuff. A lot of those guys are doing some great stuff. I can go ping those guys afterwards and be like, I love what you're doing, but you're totally wrong about Maria, and I can actually have that conversation. <laughs> That's another you know, huge perk, because you get to hang out with cool people like Julian, so learn this stuff, it's fun. Anyway, with that, that's all I've got. Are there any other questions? Yes? I was wondering if you would use Ansible for packaging your plugins and stuff as well, or would that be more like Composer? Uh, the question is, could you use Ansible <laughs> for packaging your plugins? I. I'm not going to say definitely no. Uh, I could see using WP CLI. I could see, for example, maybe you want to say, I want these plugins on my site, on all sites that I run, 
uh, and, and sort of having a WP CLI script with those specific plugins listed in Ansible, that would make sense to me. But as far as actually installing plugins, I feel like you'd be reinventing a wheel there. I, I'm not saying for sure that that's a no, but I, I feel like WP CLI does a pretty good job of it, and I, I don't know that I'd reinvent the wheel personally. So you would set up CLI in Ansible? Yeah, they do, actually. The guy sitting right next to you, he, uh, so Roots, again, if you're doing something in production, by the way, I can't recommend Trellis and DVD for that matter, highly enough. I don't work for them, and, uh, but it's, it's great. It's absolutely great. You should still go play with this stuff on your own, though. I really do believe that. It's not because Trellis is broken. It's not. It's because for you to actually contribute to something like Trellis and make it better, you need to do some of this stuff by hand. It's how we learn. I really do believe that. And it's, I say that because I've written more bad code. It's how I've learned. I, you know, it's, it's important. So I think I've maybe got seven minutes for questions. That's cool. How can I help? Mike, again, anybody else? I'll, you as well. I have a question, but I'll echo what you said. Um, I had a partner that tried to get me to use DVD, and it, it was overwhelming. And then I just went in and started doing my own Vagrant script, and yeah. I finally got it. So uh, again, for the sake of the camera, he, he has worked with VVD before and it was a bit overwhelming. For me personally, I like VVD, it's great. There's a lot of magic happening and I don't see it. And I, that makes me very uncomfortable. I want to know what it's installing, I want to know where and how and what settings because I want to tweak them and I want to break stuff. This is what I do. So, but yeah. The question was, and this is because you're doing a lot more infrastructure stuff, have mm -hmm. you CoreOS yet? CoreOS, I've not. Have you? Um, no, I uh, learned about it at a conference two days ago. Let's go launch a server, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a chance to go to the All right, so we're going to go, I, if you're free after this, we're going to go launch a CoreOS server and see if we can get it in Ansible. Why not? So uh, he was asking if I played with CoreOS. I have not. Uh, I saw there was a question back here and also a question up here. Yes, sir. Uh, can you give some case studies of where it has been put to use and is it used for content applications? Has, has Ansible been used for content applications? Not. What do you mean? You could do that. So, for example, you could say, uh, the Jim's question is, could you manage, uh, like, let's suppose you wanted to have this file on these different servers, for example. Uh, you could, in theory, but I would kind of gear more towards using a distributed file system for that. Uh, is that what you're asking about? Like, how do I? So the comments are going to be stored in the database, but the images are going to be stored in the file system. Some of the other things, like plugins, for example. Uh, the gentleman behind, you guys are load balancing, right? Are you using a distributed file system, or are you having images looped around through Ansible? I'm guessing you use a distributed file system. What file system do you use? No, 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 the file system is how do you make sure that all of the images end up on all of the different servers? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll circle up with him in a moment. 